the end of our live coverage of today's hearing. We'll re-air it here on C-SPAN through the night. The House Judiciary Committee Chairman Henry Hyde has returned to the room. The chair now recognizes the president's counsel, Mr. Kendall, to examine the witness for 30 minutes should he choose to do so. Mr. Kendall. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Conyers, members of the committee, my name is David Kendall. I'm the personal attorney for President Clinton. My task is to respond to the two hours of uninterrupted testimony from the independent counsel as well as to his four-year, $45 million investigation, which has included at least 28 attorneys, 
78 FBI agents, and an undisclosed number of private investigators. An investigation which is generated by a computer count, 114,532 news stories in print, and 2,513 minutes of network television time, not to mention 24-hour scandal coverage on cable, a 445-page referral, 50,000 pages of documents from secret grand jury testimony, four hours of videotape testimony, 22 hours of audio tape, some of which was gathered in violation of state law, and the testimony of scores of witnesses, not one of whom has been cross-examined. And I have 30 minutes to do this. Uh, it's a daunting exercise, but let me begin with the simple but powerful truth that nothing in this overkill of investigation amounts to a justification for the impeachment of the President of the United States. Mr. Starr, good evening. Good evening. Uh, How are you, David? I'm very well, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have the book of exhibits before you, do you not? I do. Uh, would you... Uh, turn to tab five, <clears throat> which is a press release which your office indicate, <clears throat> issued under your name on February 5, 1998. Do, do you see that? I do. I want to direct your attention to your statement, and you're, you're addressing the fact that you've not been able to talk to Ms. Lewinsky yet. And you say in your press release, we cannot responsibly determine whether she's telling the truth without speaking directly to her. We found that there is no substitute for looking a witness in the eye, asking detailed questions, matching the answers against verifiable facts, and if appropriate, giving a polygraph test. Did you issue that press release saying that, Mr. Starr? Yes, I did. And questions have been addressed uh, to you uh, today about the credibility of various witnesses, including Ms. Lewinsky. It's true, is it not, that you were not present when Ms. Lewinsky testified before the grand jury? That is true. And you were not present at her deposition? At her deposition? <laughs> yes. Were you aware that Ms. Lewinsky was deposed? Oh, I'm sorry, in, in our deposition. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. Yes, I was, I, I was not present. Uh, you were not present on any occasion when she was interviewed by FBI agents, were you? That is correct. I was not. And you've never really exchanged words with Ms. Lewinsky, have you? That's correct. Uh, she, uh, th the answer is uh, yes. Uh, I, I have not had occasion to uh, meet or otherwise to uh, look her in the eye myself. Uh, the same is true for her mother, Marcia Lewis, is it not? Yes, that is true as, as well. Uh, th that is true. Uh, the same is true for Betty Curry. Yes. The same is true for Vernon Jordan? Well, oh, in connection, I happen to know Mr. Jordan, but yes, in connection, in connection with this, with this yes, case, of, though, of, were you present during his grand jury testimony? No, I was not. Uh, and were you present in any interview of him? Uh, no, I was not. Uh, would the same be true for Mr. Podesta? Uh, the answer is the same with respect to Mr. Podesta, yes. And indeed, Mr. Starr, there are 115 individual grand jury uh, transcripts which your office submitted to the House. And with the exception of the deposition of the President of the United States, you were present at none of those grand jury proceedings, were you? That is correct. Likewise, there were 19 depositions submitted, and you were at least the reporter doesn't show you being present on any of those. Is that correct? I think that's right. Uh, there were, and I need to reflect on some of the Secret Service matters, but I think you're co correct that I was not actually present for any of the uh, depositions themselves, including of Secret Service officers. And there are 134 FBI Form 302 interviews submitted. You're not, being, you're not shown as being present at any of those, are you? That's correct. I would ordinarily not be present for uh, an interview uh, of, of a witness. Uh, Mr. Starr, I, I bring this out not to cast any aspersions uh, or to question your use of time, <laughs> but you are here as 
and I believe you've already said this, you are not a fact witness. Is that correct? Yes, in terms of, uh, well, I can testify to a number of facts in the investigation. Such as your own autobiography. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about facts <laughs> about this investigation. No, uh, could, I, could I answer the, 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 the question? Uh, I believe that there are a number of facts that I can, in fact, testify to. Uh, but with respect specifically that are relevant to this investigation and most particularly with respect to the abuse of power issues. But with respect to other questions, uh, the president's uh, uh, perjury and obstruction of justice and the like, to the extent that one is talking about fact witnesses, you're quite right. The function of the independent counsel himself or herself is ordinarily, ordinarily, depending on the size of the investigation, not one to accompany FBI agents. One relies upon the professionalism and the expertise of one's colleagues in the FBI who work uh, ultimately uh, under the uh, aegis of Judge Free. Uh, <clears throat> there were, <clears throat> unlike the 1974 grand jury referral to the House Judiciary Committee, uh, this, this referral was not submitted to Chief Judge, the Chief Judge of the District Court, was it? The answer to that, and I may want to uh, reserve part of my answer for executive session, uh, let me say that we did not uh, seek uh, the approval of the Chief Judge with respect to the contents uh, of the report. Was she ever shown a copy of the referral? I would prefer to uh, go into executive session with respect to communications I may have had with uh, the district court? Uh, the grand jury uh, did not vote to approve or forward this referral. Is that correct? That is correct because, as I have said, the uh, decision with respect to the referral is the product of career prosecutors who came together from around the country and I tried to make sure that the committee understood that the individuals who are involved in assisting me and in guiding me are career Department of Justice, U.S. Attorney's Office prosecutors from around the country. Uh, but ultimately this is, uh, 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 David, my, my judgment. Uh, <clears throat> you're here really as an advocate for this referral, are you not? I view myself, no, I think that's uh, not right. Uh, I do believe in the referral. Uh, I've tried to answer questions with respect to the referral, although many questions did not relate to the referral, but related to other matters. Uh, but I do believe uh, in it. But the reason that I should not be advocating is because it is this committee's judgment that they will come to by virtue of the submission of this in writing with the supporting materials, and then it's up to the committee to determine do they want to call additional witnesses uh, and the like. Uh, I, I, our, I, I'm sorry. Yes, our, our task was to put before them the information that we found uh, met the statutory standard of substantial and credible information. Uh, in your testimony uh, today, you indicated that you had exonerated the president with regard to the travel office, if, if I heard you correctly. Is that correct? Yes, what I indicated was that we had no uh, information that uh, uh, related to uh, his involvement, although I also made it clear that that investigation is continuing and we hope to announce decisions or actions uh, very soon. The travel office firings which you're investigating occurred in 1993, is that correct? The, yes, the firings were in 1993. Uh, also, if I heard you correctly this morning, you indicated that you had exonerated the president with respect to the FBI files matter, which had arisen in 1996. Was that correct? Yes, that jurisdiction did come to us in 1996 from the Attorney General. And yes, we have found, as I indicated, no uh, evidence of any wrongdoing uh, by uh, uh, anyone who is relevant at least, in my, my assessment, I can't speak for the committee, that would be relevant to the committee's assessment. <coughs> Mr. Starr, when did you come to those conclusions? When the travel, I would frankly have to uh, search my recollection to see exactly 
where we were and when we were there, as I indicated with respect to the travel office, we have in fact had to put part of the travel office uh, investigation, and I'm now talking about travel office, I'll come to the FBI files. We had to put part of the travel office investigation uh, on hold, uh, as it were, because of issues over privileged litigation, which we did not prevail in, in in the Supreme Court. And there are other matters that we are presently examining and which I can't uh, talk, about, uh, talk about here. But were, were the two exonerations you announced today, did you come to those conclusions before or after November 1, 1998? before November 1 of, of, of this year? Well, I would say that we uh, have not had information uh, that would guide us to the view that we should be concerned about the President in respect of those two matters, and that's why, of course, there's no mention of either of those matters in the referral. But both matters were, in fact, continuing, and no final prosecutorial decisions had been made with respect to either the travel office matter or now to address the FBI files matter. With respect to that, uh, there uh, is, as I've indicated, an unresolved question with respect to one individual. I've not named that individual. But I do not have any, it's, it remains unresolved. And so it's a predictive judgment, Mr. Kendall, that nothing that we're likely to achieve in either of those investigations will be relevant to this committee's inquiry. And that's what I view my duty as and, being. And today was the first time you've announced that with respect to these two matters, is it not, Mr. Starr? Yeah, it's the first uh, time that we have viewed it as appropriate to speak to issues that are still uh, David, under investigation. We are still investigating both matters, and I, and I hope I've made that point clear. Both investigations have very live, active elements to them, and we will make those decisions promptly. But I felt <clears throat> it was my duty to inform this committee of the state of the record with respect to the President of the United States because the committee has been asking me, do you have any other information that is relevant? I've received a lot of correspondence. And yep. Mr. Conyers has... Uh, uh, Mr. Congress Starr, I have only 30 minutes, if I could. I think you've ad adequately answered my question. Let me return to a question asked by Congressman Wexler this afternoon, and that was about a witness named Julie Hyatt Steele. Uh, have your investigators investigated the adoption of her eight-year-old child uh, she adopted from a Romanian orphanage? Mr. Kendall, my investigators work very hard and diligently to find relevant evidence. I believe that the questions, and I've conducted no specific investigation, and you just spent a good deal of time establishing that I don't go with my FBI agents on every single interview. Indeed, I don't go with, may I finish? You asked the question. Mm -hmm. I don't go with them on interviews. They have a fair amount of discretion as professionals as to what is appropriate to inquire into. But let me simply say this. There is an enormous amount of misinformation and false information that is being bantied about with respect to that particular witness and the circumstances of questioning. And I will look forward at the appropriate time to be able to demonstrate that to any fair-minded person beyond any reasonable doubt. Mr. Starr, I'm asking the question for the fact. I, I'm not casting aspersions again. But it's Mr. Kendall, you just said you were not present for the following persons, Ms. Lewinsky, Marsha Lewis, and Vernon Jordan. And you're now asking me, did FBI interviews, and you talked about how many witnesses there were, and now you're asking me specifically, was a specific question asked? Uh, of, of a particular witness. I will be happy to find that out if it seems to be relevant to this committee. Mr. Starr, I don't think it's unfair to try and find out the fact because there is, there's been considerable publicity uh, about Ms. Steele's claim that that is in fact what your investigators have been doing. I was simply asking to clarify the record. Well, in, res in respect of some of her claims, 
some of her claims, and I'm going to say this even though there is an, an active part of our investigation underway, utterly without merit and utterly without foundation. Utterly without factual foundation. Is, is this one of those claims? No, I did not say that, Mr. Kendall. I am aware, <laughs> I am aware of certain... <clears throat> the, the specific question that you asked goes to whether one or a series of questions were asked, asked of one witness. And my point is, I thought that what we were here today to discuss is a referral which we believe contains substantial and credible information of potential impeachable offenses by the President of the United States. What a particular witness's demeanor was or what a particular FBI agent asked is, to my mind, quite far removed from the sober and serious uh, purposes that I thought brought us here together. And the final thing that I would say in this respect, if there is an issue with respect to the way a witness is treated, that's why courts sit. I was privileged to serve as a judge. That's why judges work. Mr. Kendall, if there's an issue with respect to the treatment of a witness, let's take it to court and have the court resolve it in an orderly way. Just as the Supreme Court of the United States said that this particular individual is entitled to an orderly disposition of her claims. Uh, in your testimony this morning, Mr. Starr, you said, we go to court and not on the talk show circuit. We're officers of the court who live in the world of law. We've presented our cases in court. That's at page 36 uh, of your testimony. Now, Mr. Charles Backley, your, your uh, press spokesman and public relations advisor, uh, has been on, by my count, uh, 10 uh, talk shows and is on Nightline tonight. I'd be happy to read them to you. This is from uh, late April, but it, does that sound about right that he's been on 11 talk shows? That probably sounds about uh, right, but I would have to do the count. But let me say that no lesser authority than Archibald Cox talked about very eloquently and moving the public information function of a prosecutor's office. Not only do we have the right, we have the duty to engage in a proper public information function because this is the public's business. We must do so in order at times to combat misinformation that is being spread about, including frequently by lawyers who claim that their clients have been grossly mistreated, which is what criminal defense lawyers are paid to do. Uh, Mr. Starr, I take it there would be no disagreement that you, as a United States prosecutor, are under a legal obligation to protect the secrecy of the grand jury process. Yes. That, uh, there's no dispute whatsoever. No dispute. In, indeed, if you turn to tab 17 of the materials, you wrote me a letter <clears throat> on February 6, 1998, and if I could direct your attention to the second paragraph of that letter. I had complained about leaks of grand jury information. Uh, you had replied, from the beginning, I have made the prohibition of leaks a principal priority of the office. It is a firing offense, as well as one that leads to criminal prosecution. In the, <clears throat> in the, you say also that you've reminded the staff that leaks are utterly intolerable. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, yes, you are reading it correctly. And has anybody been fired from your office, Mr. Starr, for leaking? No. Because uh, I don't believe anyone has leaked grand jury information, Mr. Kendall. On the day this story broke in the press, which was Wednesday, January 21, uh, you issued a press release. Do you recall that press release? Could you say that again? On January? Yes, it's on January the 21st, the day the Washington Post story ran, you issued a press release about your information policy. Do you have that here? Yes, I do. Let me direct your attention to 27. 27. And also, <clears throat> we have a blow up of, of this press release on the easel.
Now, it's a very short press release, but I'll give you a moment to read it. Have you, have you read it? I have. Good. Uh, in your testimony this morning, you uh, described the litigation that your office has been involved in. Uh, at page 36, you said you faced an extraordinary number uh, of legal disputes on issues of privilege, jurisdiction, substantive criminal law, and the like. Do you, do you see that? It's at the top of your testimony. Yes, I do. I do see you, that. You did not mention leak litigation in that list, I observe. Yes, that's correct. In fact, we have litigated on a number of occasions, producing by my count at least five district court opinions, which have all been unsealed and in the binder, and one court of appeals uh, decision on this matter, have we not? Yes, and in fact, uh, with respect to that, uh, and, and we did, uh, Mr. Kendall, and I think you will agree, uh, that we prevailed in the Court of Appeals with respect to the issue that you're talking about. And I want to be careful about what I say because I have found that some lawyers are very quick to suggest that certain comments made by prosecutors may run afoul of, of confidentiality requirements. I think I can say this. The D.C. Circuit unanimously concluded that the procedures that you had urged were entirely inappropriate, improper, unauthorized by law, and that there had to be an orderly process that was protective of very vital interests. That was a unanimous opinion by the D.C. Circuit, overturning a process that you had urged upon the district court in your effort to find out as much information inside the prosecutor's office as you possibly could. So that is, I hadn't even thought of that as one of the 17. But you're absolutely right. That is part of our litigation record. And we are now in the process, as you well know, of additional litigation. And I think that judgment should be withheld. Judgment should be withheld with respect to this question until such time as there is a judgment, an ultimate judgment in this case. Because I am confident that we have abided by our obligations. I'm confident of that. I take it you would agree with Chief Judge Johnson that enforcing Rule 6E, which enforces grand jury secrecy, is of the utmost integrity to the grand jury process? Yes. Uh, Chief Judge Johnson uh, has made it abundantly clear, and I agree with that, that the values of confidentiality of matters occurring before the grand jury is very important. And she has also ruled, has she not, that due to the serious and repetitive prima facie violations of Rule 6e, a thorough investigation is necessary and is now being conducted. This, let me direct your attention to, is in is it tab 24, and that's her opinion, which was just unsealed. Tab 24? Tab 24, page 20. <clears throat> yes, this is the October 30 and then the redacted uh, version. And there, <clears throat> pardon me. And I think this is fundamental fairness requires this body to know that the law of this circuit permitted Mr. Kendall to say, here are articles, look at the sourcing, we get to ask the prosecutor to come forward and to show that the prosecutor is not the source of this grand jury information, or of this information. And that's the process that's underway now. We're at phase two. But the law of this circuit, under the, the Barry case with which you're intimately familiar, is essentially a hair trigger. All it takes is a letter from Mr. Kendall saying, here's an article with ambiguous sourcing. I believe it may relate to the grand jury matters and a prima facie case, as is said in the law, may be established. And in this district, and I think this is a major issue for the administration of justice. In high-profile cases, Congressman Rostenkowski, Mayor Barry, again and again, the criminal defense bar of this jurisdiction is rushing into court and saying there are grand jury leaks. M Mr. Starr, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I've only sorry. got 30 minutes. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, in fact, Judge Johnson had before her 24 submissions from us as to what might be 
leaks from the independent counsel's office, did she not? And we are in the process of litigating those data. And how many you know. did she find there was prima facie reason to believe that your office had committed these leaks? And I think you know the answer to that. Under the hair trigger, Barry standard, where almost anything will satisfy, and the D.C. Circuit noted that. You, you cited the D.C. Circuit's opinion. The D.C. Circuit's opinion makes it very clear, as you know, David, that the burden on the moving party is quite limited. That's not a quote, but that's the idea. It's a very limited I burden that you have. I think the answer to my question was all 24. And are you saying that the journalists invented sources like prosecutors painted a different picture, sources in Starr's office tell us, uh, sources near Starr, prosecutors suggest, is, does the media make up those quotes, Mr. Starr? I'm not here to accuse the media of anything. I am here to say that fairness requires us to be able to litigate this matter, which as you well know, is under seal, and to litigate that in an orderly way, and then to come to a judgment as to the significance of that. But I will simply say that the law of this circuit makes it quite easy for you to say, look at this sourcing, I get to now put the burden on the prosecutor to come forward and show evidence that the prosecutor is not the source. Mr. And, Starr, and David, that's what we're doing. Mr. Starr, in fact, there has been no case remotely similar to this in terms of the massive leaking from the prosecutor's office. And I think we I know totally that. disagree with that. That's an accusation, and mm -hmm. it's an unfair accusation. I completely reject it. And I would say, David, let's wait until the litigation has concluded. You're asking to and especially with the rules being what they are on a prima facie case, you're asking, let's now come to judgment after about 10 minutes of the, f uh, of the first half. That's not fair. Okay. Uh, may I direct your attention now to the uh, exhibit that we have displayed up there? It's 27. This is, I'm sorry, number 27? Yes, it's, it's your press release on the first day of uh, the Lewinsky story breaking. Uh, it's a press release on the letterhead of the independent counsel's office. We secured it from your office through a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, it's under your name. It says independent counsel Kenneth W. Starr issued the following statement today from his office in Washington, D.C. And then it says, because of confidentiality requirements, we are unable to comment on any aspect of our work. Is that what you announced to the world on uh, January the 21st? Yes, and uh, I, I must say, I think that this is inconsistent with the duty of a prosecutor to provide appropriate and lawful public information. I think it is the duty of the prosecutor to combat the dissemination of misinformation as long as the prosecutor can do that without violating his or her obligations under Rule 6E. And that's the position, David, as you know, of the Justice Department. The uh, Justice did you issue any press release admitting that you were uh, uh, talking about aspects of your uh, investigation? I'm sorry, could you say that again? After the press release, which you now said, and I've forgotten your exact phrase, what was it, that you would not have issued it now? Well, no, I, Does I, it depend I'm, on I'm, what you mean by comment? No, in terms of being able to provide a public information function, it depends upon how broadly one wants to read a particular document. This is not a legal document. It's a statement of policy. And ordinarily, in contrast to what most prosecutors do, we try to treat all individuals, those, for example, charged with crime, with complete fairness. We do not go out and hold press conferences and the like. That is our methodology and our approach. But we follow Justice Department policy, and I frankly think that this comment is an overbroad statement because it's incompatible with DOJ policy. It is your comment, though, Mr. Starr. It's what you wanted the world to think you were doing in the Lewinsky investigation. Isn't that not a fact? It is your press release. Well, except uh, I think it is still, you're, you're, you're talking about a press release. You're not talking about a filing in court and the like. And what we were, in fact, doing 
virtually contemporaneously with this was issuing, pre it, it, it may not have been ex contemporaneously, and perhaps you'll guide me to that, but we were being accused, and we've heard it all day long today about the events at the Ritz-Carlton, and I felt duty-bound to provide public information that I thought was appropriate about the conditions that Ms. Lewinsky found herself in and that the, <clears throat> the character assassination by her then attorneys, no longer her, or at least one is no longer her attorneys, Mr. was Mr. absolutely Kendall, wrong. Your, uh, your time is up. You may want to get into the facts, so do you need additional uh, I, time? I, I think I, I would like additional time. Uh, how much, uh, Chairman Hyde, how much uh, time would you like? I, I think that the analysis, I, I believe, I'm sorry, what did you say? I was going to say, is 15 minutes helpful? Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like, I, I, that, that won't be enough, Your You're Honor. being coached by Miss Waters here now. That doesn't count. <laughs> how, how much? Uh, Your Honor, I would Thir like another, another 30 hour. minutes? C could I have another hour? Oh, no. oh wow. How about, how about 30 so you can get into the facts? I, I, I thank the Chair for 30 minutes. Uh, I think, though, that these are the facts, Your Honor. How this, <laughs> how this analysis was done, uh, the campaign to uh, disseminate information against the president is very much a part of the fairness of the document which your committee is having to consider. Very is well. The, is the analysis reliable? Is it fair? Does it present the facts? Have proper procedures been followed? I see. Well, the gentleman is recognized then for an additional 30 minutes, but Thank you. Uh, that should wind it up. So you have 30 more minutes. Uh, Mr. Starr, you were right. You did issue a press conference about Ms. Lewinsky's treatment at the Ritz-Carlton. That was a press uh, release. It was on the record. Everybody knew you were saying that. You were accountable. To use your phrase, you were transparent. But you also spoke frequently on background to the press. And my question to you is, you and those around you, your subordinates. Yes, be careful when you say the you because I do not speak frequently or otherwise to the press. Did, did Professor Dash give you any advice as to what should be on background and what on the record? We discussed with Sam a variety of issues. I would have to search my recollection with respect to any specific uh, observations that Sam uh, gave us with, with respect to this. But let me say this. If you look at and because your comments to the chairman, whom you called your honor, and I've been tempted to do that most of the day, because you and I are both accustomed to being in courthouses. When you look at the information that we had in our office and the FBI, as opposed to information that you had access to, it never, never entered the public domain, for example, The dress, the DNA, the test results, those were never in the public domain because you did not have a witness in your joint defense arrangements who you could debrief and tell you because it was the Mr. distinguished judge who is the head of the FBI and a handful of FBI. No, th this, you talk about fairness. It's time for some fairness with respect to all of these charges that keep bantied around without any kind of judicial determination that there is, in fact, wrongdoing under 6E. My question was simpler, Mr. Starr. My yes. question was, why would you speak on background? Why not be accountable? Why not be transparent? I have never protested a press release which you yes. have issued, have I? No, you have not. And, and I think that there may well be times, as a prosecutor, when you, it's necessary to correct misinformation. You've sometimes done that. It's necessary to get the facts out so that people aren't misguided. But why speak off the record on background? Why not be accountable? It depends on the circumstances. And I will say this. I believe the Justice Department practice, it certainly was the practice when I was there. I will hazard uh, that it's still the practice of the Justice Department, that these are judgment calls as to whether the prosecutor wants to make herself or himself part of the story. A specific example, if someone comes to us with a specific allegation of wrongdoing on the part of one of our prosecutors, and it may be a criminal defense lawyer who has said, the prosecutor did the following bad things. 
it may be utterly bogus because people do in fact lie about what happens to their clients and I'm sorry to say that. We do not want to in any way be part of a story as to whether, and obviously we can't talk about matters occurring before the grand jury, but we can in fact respond to a suggestion that the FBI in some way or a prosecutor in some way conducted herself or himself improperly but it is quite wise to say... Then why not well, say it on the record? What, what, because, why the secrecy? Be, because, and you're asking essentially press policy as opposed to constitutional issues that have brought us all here, and if this is an oversight hearing with respect to the press policy of the Independent Counsel's Office, or if that's what the President's lawyer wants to spend his time doing, then that is your prerogative. So let me tell you then what our press policy is. Well, Mr. Mr. Starr, I've only got 30 minutes. Uh, I've asked you... <laughs> I think a simple question, but, but let me move on. You yourself executed an affidavit in the leaks investigation, did you not? David, this matter is in litigation, and Mr. Chairman, as a matter of fairness, <clears throat> I have to be careful about what I say because he may tell me that it's not under, it's just not right to be in litigation under seal before the district court and to be cross-examined by the president's attorney with respect to that matter which seems to have no germaneness whatever. Mr. Starr, I, I was going to ask you about an affidavit, a sworn declaration which you yourself executed, which is not under seal uh, in, in, in the leaks proceeding. But I will move on if this, uh, if this, uh, if this is not something you want to respond to. Well, David, but I just think if you're talking about the leaks litigation, that's the point. It is in litigation. Why don't we allow that litigation to go forward instead of individuals, members of Congress who talk about fairness, jumping to the conclusion that there has been a violation when there's been no adjudication of anything beyond <clears throat> the existence under the law of this circuit of a prima facie case. That is unfair. It's unfair to my career prosecutors. It's unfair to investigators. It's wrong. And just to finish the point, when we had highly sensitive information that Mr. Kendall did not have, the DNA on the dress that was held within our office and the FBI, there was no dissemination of that information. But what happens is Mr. Kendall and others interview witnesses and any criminal defense lawyer, and if you see fit to inquire into the joint defense arrangement in existence here, I would be grateful. And I know you want to move forward with these proceedings. But the joint defense arrangement that has been in effect in this operation is a very significant aspect of the very issues that Mr. Kendall is now raising before this committee. Because one of the issues in Mr. 6E... Starr, excuse me. Could I direct your attention to tab 15? I, I think you've answered the question. And I, I would like to move on. I am running against the clock. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Kendall. I've been here since 10 o'clock, so forgive me. I know, me. and, it, and it, it, uh, I, I, will, I will move on. Uh, Carol Bruce, Ms. Carol Bruce, was appointed uh, independent counsel to investigate the uh, Indian gambling casino matter, was she not? Yes, the uh, Secretary Babbitt matter, right. yes. Are, are, are you aware of her press policy? No, I'm not. Uh, it's, it's indicated there at tab 15 that she held a press conference when she was appointed and then said she did not anticipate making any p further public comments until the investigation is completed. Uh, you mentioned the experience of Ms. Lewinsky uh, at the Ritz-Carlton on Friday, uh, January the 16th, 1998. Uh, one of the reasons you your agents uh, held Ms. Lewinsky was that they that wanted... That is, I, I, I have to interrupt, that is the... That right, premise I was not is meaning false. to be offensive. Let, let, let me rephrase That is it. false, and you know it to be false. Well, I'll rephrase the question. She Mr. was Mr. not held. Uh, she, her own psychological state will speak for itself uh, as to how she felt. It's in the record in her testimony. You that, said she was held. You didn't I, say how she felt. You said she was held, and I think that's unfair to our investigators. I and this issue has been litigated, David, as you well know, with respect to the constitutional rights of, of, of the individual involved. Excuse me. During her sojourn with your agents, 
Well, the Ritz-Carlton is a very pleasant One place to have a sojourn. was to get Ms. Lewinsky to wear a recording device and surreptitiously record Mr. Jordan or the president, was it not? It was not. And I know that there is testimony and that this has been referred to, but let me explain. She was asked and given the opportunity, which she turned down, to be a cooperating witness. And we explained to her, we did not invent this. This is all traditional prosecutorial activity and techniques. And we said one of the things that a cooperating witness can do is to assist us in consensual monitoring. We described that at a high level of generality is my understanding, and I believe my prosecutors, in fact, conducted themselves consistently with what I have just told you. Uh, could you turn to tab seven, and could we have... I'm uh, sorry, tab seven? Yes, tab seven of the binder. Uh, you may have read the Time magazine essay, essay excuse me, <clears throat> by Messrs. Ginsburg and Spates, in which they state the following. The government didn't just want our client to tell her story. They wanted her wired. They wanted her to record telephone calls with the President of the United States, Vernon Jordan, and others at their will. You're familiar with Mr. Ginsburg's charge. Mr. Ginsburg is wrong, and he must know that he is wrong. He was wrong then, and it is a calumny to repeat that now. Mr. Ginsburg was not known for his consistency of articulating positions. <laughs> nor, was he, nor was he known for his consistency in dealing with facts. Mm -hmm. I would say that he was rather fast and loose with the facts, and if you are going to rely in this proceeding on a Time magazine essay by Bill Ginsburg, then I think the standards are not quite as lofty as I thought they would be this evening. Mr. Starr, what is an FBI 302 form? An FBI 302 form is a report of uh, interview by uh, FBI agents uh, with a witness. Now, you categorically denied wanting to have Ms. Lewinsky wear a wire or secretly tape record the President or Mr. Jordan when the charge was made in the Time article, did you not? You categorically denied that. Are you saying... At the time of this Time article? At the time of that Time article, you denied Mr. Ginsburg's charge, did you not? I believe that we did, but I'm just not recalling specifically uh, how you, we did you it. You certainly then. denied it, and there was a... We've had a number of charges, so you'll have to remind me of where my... All right, let, let, let me direct you to tab 12 in the uh, volume. And this is the later, your later editor, uh, your later letter to Steve Brill. We're displaying the page there. And it's, um, it's page seven. You don't have to read your entire letter. Okay, page seven. Yes, do you see um, where, where it's indented six? It's tab 12, page seven of the exhibit, your own letter. You say, this is false. This office never asked Ms. Lewinsky to agree to wire herself for conversation with Mr. Jordan or the president. You cite no source at all, no, nor could you, as we had no such plans. Have I read correctly your letter? Yes, you have. All right. Now, when you wrote the letter, did you review... You, you were not present at the Ritz-Carlton, were you? No, I was not. Uh, did you review with Mr. Emick, for example, what had happened there? Uh, yes, I have reviewed with a number... Uh, well, in, in terms of this uh, particular letter, but if you're, if you're asking... Did I review the events of the Ritz-Carlton in connection with this as opposed to what we had already done in terms of the allegations being made at or around the time? Uh, I do have very vivid recollections of discussions with respect to the circumstances do, do, do you of, remember if you reviewed, uh, of the Ritz-Carlton. But I'm, I'm just not, you're, you're asking me, in connection with this letter, did I have a conversation with one of my colleagues, and I would, I would have to review notes and so forth. I apologize for my speed, but I don't have much time. I don't usually talk this fast, Mr. Starr. Would you look at page, uh, tab 13? Okay. Now, tab 13 is the FBI 302 form describing 
That's not Mr. Ginsburg or Mr. Spates, is it? That's one of your own agents. We don't know who because the name is blacked out, but if you look at uh, page five of that exhibit, it says at 11.22 p.m., it says AIC Emick talked to Bernard Lewinsky, that is Ms. Lewinsky's father, cooperation and interview, telephone calls, body wires and testimony were mentioned. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And then do you see down below, uh, below the 1137 entry, <clears throat> Ms. Lewis has arrived on the scene, Ms. Lewinsky's mother, and she expresses, Ms. Lewinsky has expressed concern about what's being requested of her. She says, according to the FBI 302, what if I partially cooperate? That's as recorded by the FBI agent. Marsha Lewis asked, what would happen if Monica Lewinsky gave everything but did not tape anything? Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, it was in the grand jury that the events of Friday, January the 16th, uh, were presented through the testimony of, of Ms. Lewinsky. Was it not? Was it her second appearance? Yes, I believe that's right. And do you remember, and this is, if, do you have the appendices to your uh, volume? I, 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 can, I can get them. Uh, I, I don't think we'll need to because this is a famous uh, passage. Uh, the, the grand jurors, the, your prosecutors had no more questions, and uh, the grand jurors themselves began to inquire about the events that day. Uh, one of them said at page 1143, we want to know about that day. We really want to know about that day. And this elicited then from Ms. Lewinsky, who was under oath, uh, a tearful description of what had happened to her. She asked Mr. Emick to leave the room, did she not? Uh, that's my recollection of the transcript, yes. And in fact, she said that uh, she was uh, told on Friday, uh, January the 16th, by your agents that she'd have to place calls or wear a wire to see, to call Betty and Mr. Jordan and possibly the president. Question, and did you tell them you didn't want to do that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that, was that Ms. Lewinsky's testimony? Yes, that is her testimony. I, I think the point was made earlier, but the, the affidavit that Ms. Lewinsky filed uh, had not been mailed by her attorney on, uh, until the end of the day, Friday, January the 16th, had it. I believe that's right in terms of the, the timing uh, that, but I would have to reconstruct that in terms of the actual uh, timing of the mailing. I, 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 I'm sorry, I would have to double check that. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Starr, you, you've repeatedly said uh, that the Attorney General asked you uh, to take on this matter. Uh, well, that's, that, that's your characterization. I have said that we collaborated with the Justice Department and the Attorney General came to her decision. We uh, brought it to her attention. We did say that we thought that the steps that we'd taken had been within our jurisdiction, but we were concerned about whether any additional step could be taken properly within our jurisdiction. And, and that's how the discussions uh, began. In fact, you requested that the matter be referred to you, did you not? At uh, some point during the uh, discussion, we, in our own deliberations, we came to the view that we felt that because of the involvement, and I'll be very specific here, of Vernon Jordan, that this was related to our existing jurisdiction. The Attorney General disagreed with that. Uh, but that was our view. Here was Linda Tripp, who was a witness in the travel office matter and the Vincent Foster documents matter and, and the Vincent Foster death matter. And she had come to us with information. And so we felt very comfortable. A and she said, I'm being asked to commit crimes. I'm being asked to commit perjury. But we felt comfortable that we were within our jurisdiction at that, at that juncture. But we did feel that there was a jurisdictional issue from that point forward, which we worked on collaboratively with the Justice Department. But we did, in fact, send a letter indicating that we felt that this uh, was related to our jurisdiction. 
But I hasten to note that the Attorney General disagreed with that and said, no, it's not related to your existing jurisdiction, but we think your office should investigate it. We can't because the President is implicated. In her transmission to the Special Division, uh, the Attorney General stated, independent counsel star has requested that this matter be referred to him. Is that not the case? Well, uh, you'll have to refer me. What, where, I'm where sorry, I don't have that oh, okay. in your binder. Yes, well, uh, I will represent uh, David, I, yes, you. Uh, I, 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 in her. I, I'm certainly going to accede to your representation. Uh, and, it, and it certainly is true, as I just indicated, that we did, in fact, send a written submission indicating that we felt that this was related to our jurisdiction. The Attorney General felt we should have jurisdiction, but disagreed that under the statute it should be an expansion of our existing jurisdiction. Mr. Starr, when did you first learn, you yourself, that there might be an audio tape uh, with a conversation involving the President and a young woman? Uh, the young woman. Uh, a young woman. I'm sorry? A young woman. Oh. I think we've had questions about that, and I, I, have, I have been asked that, and, I, and I'm searching my recollection, but let me say this. If you're talking about Monica Lewinsky, and I don't know that you are, you didn't use her name, but the first I knew to the best of my knowledge and recollection of Monica Lewinsky was in January of 1998. Now, I had questions and they seem to me to suggest that there is some information with respect to information that may have come to me in November of 1997 with respect to tapes and it was all very vague and enshrouded in mystery and I said I will be happy to respond if I get uh, some ad additional information. Uh, with respect to Monica Lewinsky, which I assume is what we're here to talk about, I did not know anything about Monica Lewinsky to the best of my uh, in, uh, recollection. I don't think I ever had occasion to meet her or otherwise hear about her until January of 1998. Were, were you aware of how uh, Ms. Tripp uh, came to uh, communicate with your office in January of 1998? I was told, I'll be very specific, and I can be very brief. Uh, I was at an American Bar Association journal board of uh, editors meeting when the initial contact was made with one of the uh, associate independent counsels. I do not believe in that, and that was on January 8th, and I do not believe in that contact Linda Tripp's name was mentioned. That information was brought back to Washington. The information was conveyed to uh, a deputy independent counsel who said, information comes in the front door and I'm not sure at that time that we knew who this person was we were then called on January 12th by Linda Tripp that was a telephone call and I was made aware of the telephone call promptly thereafter and that's when uh, it was brought to my attention uh, that there was information that we would proceed to, uh, to, to act on. Were you aware that your partner, Richard Porter, had played a role in steering Miss Tripp to your office? Uh, I know Richard. Uh, I am not uh, uh, aware of what his role was. I have since read about what his role was, but I did not in any way have any involvement whatsoever or participation in in any way with whatever he did. And, and I've not conducted an investigation. Uh, there may be facts of which I am unaware that I should be aware in terms of before I formulated a complete, uh, a complete response. Uh, could you turn to tab two, Mr. Starr? It's a provision of the Independent Council Statute. It's 28 U.S.C. 594J. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, and, and that, you've, you've made the point that you, you kept your law practice as you were legally entitled to do. Uh, you made, I think, over a million dollars each year for the last four from that law practice, again, as you were legally entitled to do. But in, in exchange for allowing uh, private counsel to serve part-time as independent counsel, the Ethics in Government Act enforced a very strict conflict of interest rule, did it not? And that's yes, it's very, it's very specific, yes. Mm -hmm. 
And that says that any independent counsel cannot have any person associated with a firm, not just a partner, uh, represent in any matter any person involved in any investigation or prosecution under this chapter. Is that correct? I believe that's right. I would have to reread it, but I'm going to simply accept uh, uh, your, your representation. But, but I think that is correct. Uh, can I call your attention to Exhibit 4, which is uh, another 302 interview for, form? Uh, and that's for Ms. Lucianne Goldberg. Uh, it's at tab 4. <clears throat> yes, I, I do have it. Uh, at, at page uh, 1232 of the exhibit, do you see that one of your agents is describing why Linda Tripp is nervous? And, and where, where I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I have it, not it, read it, this it's 302. 12, it's 1232. Yes, but, I'm there, but what paragraph? All right, it's the paragraph that begins, uh, in the meantime, because Tripp. I, it's not on my page 1232. I beg your pardon, it's 1231. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, Goldberg called around to friends she has, including one in Chicago who works at the same firm Ken Starr does. This person recommended Goldberg to call Jackie Bennett at the OIC. Goldberg advised that the OIC knew who this person is and that this person is very nervous at this time. Uh, did you ever have any reports from any source that some uh, person at your law firm had expressed nervousness about this contact with Linda Tripp? Uh, you're talking about at any time? And any time. Well, you, you just brought this to my uh, attention. Um, but uh, I, am, I do not uh, know, I don't have a, a recollection of uh, something being brought, you're talking about to my attention. Did, did, yeah. you, oh, no. did you cause any check to be made at any time before you sought jurisdiction in the Lewinsky matter as to whether any person in your law firm had any kind of an association with the Paula Jones case? No, I did not. But I must say, what you pointed me to in the statute was representation, and I've, I've read the 302 quickly for the first time. I've not had occasion to read this 302, uh, and the 302 does not talk about uh, representation. It talks about calling a friend. It's possible, is it not, Mr. Starr, for the provision of, of legal advice of some kind to involve a representation, at least for conflict of interest purposes, even if there's no written retainer, there's no formal hiring of a person. Well, I th I, I'm not sure I would readily agree with that. And let me just say this. Conflict of interest analysis is, as you well know, because you're a partner in a very prestigious law firm, is very technical and very complicated and very careful evaluation has to be made and that's why I'm sure at your firm as we do at our firm, the firm in which I'm on leave of absence, we have a partner who is dedicated to the issue, to the analysis of these very issues. So these are things that you assess all the facts. What is a conflict? As you know, the issue of conflict is one that is at times a very, very much a judgment call that reasonable persons have to have uh, an enormous amount of information in order to, uh, to, to come to that judgment. Mr. Starr, can I direct your attention to uh, uh, exhibit at tab 14, please? Do you have that exhibit? Yes, I do. Uh, that is a Washington Post article from June of 1997 uh, indicating that your investigators are now probing uh, rumors uh, about the president, is it not? It is an article about that subject, yes. And indicating that state troopers, uh, two who are named and quoted, Ronnie Anderson and Roger Perry, 
uh, are being interviewed about rumors of affairs that the president had while he was governor uh, of Arkansas. Is that correct? That's what the story is about. Uh, you're but whether the story reflects the facts is obviously a different matter. Uh, did you cause any investigation to be done as to whether, in fact, your investigators were asking uh, witnesses about a list of 12 to 15 women by name, including Paula Corbin Jones? When this, uh, and we were in uh, Little Rock uh, uh, at the time, n namely all the attorneys were in Little Rock as we were assessing a very important uh, issue. And when we were in the midst of our discussions, we were receiving urgent inquiries from uh, the Washington Post asking about interviews, and you're quite right in pointing out that this was uh, a uh, Washington Post piece from June of 97. They were talking about interviews that had been conducted in February, so it was old news. Uh, uh, and we did then inquire in light of this, we then did make inquiries internally of the, of the FBI, because these are professional agents, and we said, what kinds of questions are being asked? What is the purpose? And the purpose of the investigation was as we were moving forward in the Little Rock phase of our investigation, we wanted to make sure, as investigators should do and as prosecutors should do, that we had reached out and interviewed anyone who might have relevant uh, information. And that's what we were doing. We were in and the fact relevance of this. Inter did you go to the Attorney General and seek an expansion of your jurisdiction to accompany this particular investigation? Uh, um, I guess I wasn't uh, clear. This was the whitewater phase of our investigation that is referenced here in the post. We're talking about Little Rock. We're not talking about activity in Washington. And we were, in fact, uh, interviewing, as good prosecutors, good investigators do, uh, individuals who would have information that may be relevant to our inquiry about the President's involvement in Whitewater, in Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan, and the like, and specifically a loan from Madison Guarantee that we had information on in which we were not able to secure as much information as we would like, given the records at the bank and given Susan McDougall's a lack of cooperation. Uh, as you know, as, as you well know, Susan McDougall was not cooperating with the investigation, and indeed, as we know, you spent time with Susan McDougall during the course of the trial, representing the president's interest uh, to communicate with her, as you're entitled to do. We're also entitled, just as you're entitled to reach out to your fellow criminal defense lawyers, we're entitled to reach out to witnesses who may have relevant information. Did you use private investigators to do this? Uh uh, investigation into the uh, 12 to 15 women? I beg your pardon, private investigators? Yes, your GAO report uh, for oh, the I, last I'm, I'm three sorry. times has an, an, uh, a line item of approximately, it varies, but it's about half a million dollars for, among other things, private investigators. Uh, no, we have never hired Terry Lenzner, David. <laughs> what, 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 but, what is that what, private but, investigative but expense? What, but what we okay. do do is we do hire retired FBI agents. And those are, you know, I'll have to look at the, you're, you're talking about an audit report, and if you want to guide me to the audit report, that's fine. Well, the, chair, the chair's got to intervene. The hour is uh, over uh, quite a little bit. The, Mr. Lowell and Mr. Kendall have had two hours. Uh, Mr. Uh, Shippers has been waiting since 10 o'clock and is getting testy, um, which is his natural state. Uh, <laughs> Ms. But, but uh, M Mr. Kendall, you will have an opportunity, a further opportunity, to present uh, and, and address the committee at length, in extenso, as you lawyers say, uh, and uh, offer whatever evidence, exculpatory or otherwise you want. You, you'll have a full opportunity before we go to any markup, if we go to a markup. So uh, really, it's a long day. Uh, I, I, one must have some compassion for Mr. Starr. And uh, Mr. Not, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I thank you, but I would, 
I would simply request Mr. Starr testified for two and a quarter hours. I'm, I'm simply trying to get my fair crack at him. I would like to go into omissions from the referral and other areas. Mr. Chairman, it's, well, it's, I'm, it's I'm been sure a long that day. I would come back tomorrow if that were. Well, I, I don't think many of us want to come back tomorrow. So, but we, you will have an, really, you will have an opportunity to address the committee fully and produce whatever you want. Uh, by way of evidence, witnesses, exculpatory material. We will not foreclose you, but the night is waning and we'd like to get to Mr. Shippers. So with your kind indulgence, and I see you're putting your glasses away, which is a healthy sign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Starr, do you want a little break or? No, Mr. Chairman. Uh, okay. I'm, we're at we're at the final. We're almost at my bedtime. All so. right, we're Mr. Chairman. I would mind. I can assure you. Uh, the, the the gentle the gentle lady from California. I'd like to. Um, I'd like to inquire of the chair. What opportunity will we have to clarify what appears to have been conflicting information that we have received here today uh, from our star witness? I'd write a letter to Mr. Starr if I were you. If I were confused about some of the evidence, I'd write him a nice letter and I'd say, please straighten me out and I'll bet he'd answer you. Well, I think it's a little deeper than that. Uh, it may go to perjury. Uh, this man is under oath. Well, he is under oath, and uh, if, are you charging him with perjury? I would like clarification, and after the clarification is made, I can determine whether or not well, I would Ms. make Waters, that charge. Uh, Ms. Waters, the chair has to control this uh, committee. Uh, we have been at it all day, and I think what you're asking at this late moment uh, is an imposition on the committee, not to mention Mr. Starr. So you would not be recognized for that purpose, but I will recognize Mr. Shippers for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <sighs> Judge Starr, my name is David Shippers, and I'm the Chief Investigative Counsel for the committee. Can you hear me? Now I can. Thank you. I will uh, try to be as brief as I possibly can, but I do have a little bit of territory to cover, as you well know. Yes. I'll begin with some of Mr. Kendall's statements and some of Mr. Kendall's uh, questions to you. First of all, do I understand that there is such a thing as a hair trigger? Uh, you, you refer to a hair trigger that would set off a, uh, an investigation of whether or not there were leaks out of your office? Yes. Uh, and that, this, hair, that right. hair trigger can be, uh, and often is, triggered by a defense attorney sending a, something to the judge claiming that there's a leak. Is that right? It is, uh, yes. It is standard practice for criminal defense lawyers to charge leaks of grand jury information. Their allies then pick up the charge, uh, and suddenly it becomes uh, conventional wisdom that there has, in fact, been some final adjudication, which is uh, wrong as a matter of law and unfair just in terms of basic human decency, because these are professional prosecutors, and we're talking about... Thank you, Judge. Yes, I'm sorry. Now... <laughs> Do I understand that Mr. Kendall sent 27 of such requests to the judge here claiming leaks? Well, he, he sent a number, and I think he had uh, some 24 exhibits, which, again, I've been reluctant to talk about because it is in litigation. I mean, the specifics are in litigation, as, as, uh, as, as David knows. Well, Judge, if I were expecting someone to testify before a congressional committee and I wanted some questions to ask him about leaks, all I'd have to do is send some letters to the judge and trigger this hair trigger effect. Isn't that correct? Well, with the... Uh, I, I guess I, I don't want to suggest that the hair trigger is, is a non-existent trigger, but the burden on the defense lawyer is quite modest. And one of the things that we've learned, if, and I don't... I know this is your time, but I would just say one of the things that we've learned in this investigation is that a lot of people, including Mr. Kendall, talk on background and the like. And the sourcing that is then used by the reporter becomes very important. Someone as responsible as Tim Russert sourced 
a story in such a way that it looked like it came from us, he was decent and honorable enough to say, no, it didn't come from Starr's office. It, in fact, with all due respect, came from the Congress. Now, you're not under a 6 e obligation, so you can talk as freely as you would like, and indeed you enjoy speech and debate clause immunity. However, prosecutors are very sensitive, especially in this jurisdiction, in light of the hair trigger, to a reporter who sort of says, sources close to, well, what does that mean? It can mean almost anyone. And I think that one of the things that this litigation will, in fact, show, but uh, is that that becomes an issue ever so quickly as we saw in the Marion Berry case and as we saw in the Dan Rostenkowski case. And I judge uh, Mr. Kendall mentioned massive leaking. I'm going to ask you a specific and direct question. As you sit there, do you have any information, evidence, or anything in your possession to indicate that anyone in your office has leaked anything, any 6E material? Well, again, it depends on what one means by 6E, because there are issues. I have a press release. Within your, your no, definition within, of 6E. Within my, within my understanding, and I think that my understanding is correct, no, I can say here that, that, that now. But I also think that it's important for this litigation that I've talked about to go forward and let's see what happens in that litigation again is under seal, but there's an orderly process just as the Supreme Court said in the Paula Corbin Jones case. Let's allow that orderly process to go forward. Fine. Now, sir, you were asked whether you were present during the taking of the 302s, the FBI interviews, whether you were present at the grand jury uh, appearances of all these witnesses, whether you were present during the course of uh, interviews and depositions, and you answered no. Isn't that correct? That's correct. But you did have experienced, highly experienced professional agents and prosecutors present at each and every one of those occasions, did you not? I did. And you relied upon the integrity, the honesty, and the decency of those agents and investigators, did you not? I did, and very proudly so. All right, now, I noticed that Mr. We've heard an awful lot about fairness here, Judge Starr. But I noticed that when you sat down this morning, you were given about two inches of documents to review. How long did you have the, to review those before Mr. Lowell began questioning you? Uh, unless Mr. Lowell shipped it over this morning, uh, I left uh, the office at 9.15 to come to the House of Representatives, and I had not seen it. If it's waiting on my desk, then I suppose he gave me some notice. But no, in terms of actual notice, I had no notice whatsoever. Now, you were also given a, uh, a book filled with some 63 tabs when Mr. Kendall began to question you. When's the first time you saw that book? Uh, this evening, when I came in after uh, uh, having uh, a sandwich. And, uh, the, they, of course, they, had, they were in possession of those books before you left to have your sandwich. They didn't give it to you to review, did they? Uh, no, uh, unless it's sitting on my desk. It's not. They did not, and I, I'm confident I have to be careful what I say no. uh, because of not having universal facts. But, Mr. Shippers, no, I had no advance notice that this was going to be inquired And you were into. questioned about specific one line, two lines inside of this two-and-a-half-inch document, and you had to go and hunt for the answers, didn't you, Judge Keith? I did. Now, we have heard over two hours of questioning almost three hours of questioning if we include the Democratic members of this uh, committee. And I haven't heard anybody ask you one question about the facts of these cases. So with your permission, Judge, I'm going to take a few minutes and get to the facts and the issues that are really before this committee. First of all, Mr. Conyers in his opening statement made a remark about a recent delivery of four boxes of documents. That delivery was made, what was it, yesterday or the day before, to the Ford building. Was it not, Mr. The, or Judge Starr? Yes, I believe it was uh, the day before. Now, that wasn't your idea to, to deliver those, was it? No, it was not. It was an answer to a request by Mr. Conyers that you provide additional information, wasn't it? Yes, that, well, it was a congressional request. I believe it originated with Congressman Conyers. And you were just 
We've had so many requests. We've had individual requests from individual members. I don't mean to complain, but we don't have a congressional office. We're prosecutors and lawyers, so we do the best we can. We've had a virtual flurry of requests for information, but I believe Mr. Con uh, excuse me, Congressman Conyers was one of the requesters with respect to that information, and we tried to be responsive. Yes. Now, Judge Starr, you have been investigating President Clinton and the Monica Lewinsky matter and other matters involving perjury, obstruction of justice, conspiracy, and so on, for some seven or eight months. Is that correct? Yes, I guess now ten months. Have you been given any exculpatory evidence by the President, or have you been offered any exculpatory evidence or witnesses by the President in that time? I don't believe that we have. I, I would want to check, and, and, and if I have additional information, I would provide it to the committee. But as I sit here this evening, I'm not aware of any suggestion that there is exculpatory evidence other than the discussion we've had here today with respect to what uh, one individual witness may have said. But no, no witness has come forward to say Monica Lewinsky made it all up. No one has suggested that. No one has suggested, so I, I'm sorry to be going on, but the point is. I think you've answered the question. We stand too. ready to receive information, but no one has been That was my next question. If information were available and were were, had been given to you, you would have considered that along with all the other information. Is that correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, one of my colleagues uh, uh, reminds me that we specifically asked in the flurry of this investigation, we asked Mr. Kendall, by letter, please provide us with any exculpatory information. Mr. Kendall said there was nothing to exculpate, or that there was nothing to worry about exculpation from. Now, there was a great deal of uh, discussion throughout the day about the difference between your investigation and that of Mr. Jaworski. There was no independent counsel act when Mr. Jaworski was performing his duties, was there? That is correct. He had no statute to look to at all. And your actions as regards referrals to this committee are governed by federal statute, are they not, Judge? They are indeed. And you attempted to the best of your ability to comply with those federal statutes? That is correct. And if I could just add, there was no experience under this, happily for the country, under this uh, provision of the statute. So we were sailing in uncharted waters and trying to come to the best professional judgment we could about what Congress intended and wanted uh, in this provision that required us to report to it. One aside, uh, in the 63, have you had an opportunity, uh, I know you haven't had a reasonable opportunity, <laughs> but have you had any opportunity to page through Mr. Kendall's 63 tabs? Uh, only as he was guiding me, uh, Mr. Well, Schippers. I have. I have, Judge Starr, and I noted that there it is, contains several newspaper articles, several magazine articles, several self-serving letters from the President's counsel, and not one word, not one word of evidence. By the way, the other two incher is equally devoid of evidence. <laughs> During your term as independent counsel, sir, and with particular reference to your investigation of the Lewinsky matter and the perjury and the obstruction of justice and other related criminal activity, you were under the guidance and control of the Attorney General of the United States, were you not? Well, I was certainly under her ultimate supervision in terms of the provisions for removal, but uh, the, of course the independent counsel is to be independent of her uh, daily supervision. I mean that in the sense that if you were to be involved in anything untoward, unethical, illegal, the Attorney General had the absolute ability to fire you for cause, did she not? Yes, I mean the statute is clear that an independent counsel can be removed for a good cause. Now, you've been pilloried and vilified in newspapers and magazines and here, unfortunately. Has the Attorney General ever indicated that she had any thought of firing you for cause? 
I'm not aware of any expression of any uh, issue at all with respect to good cause. There are unfairness to the Attorney General uh, because of the flurry of allegations that just are just constant. There is a process of evaluation on her part, but no. Uh, and I, I meet with the Attorney General episodically uh, and her senior staff, and there has never been a suggestion that uh, there is good cause to uh, remove uh, me as independent counsel. At least I'm not aware of any suggestion. Well, you've never no, been, uh, did, has the Attorney General ever questioned uh, you about conflicts of interest or anything like that? No, the Attorney General has not, but the Attorney General has a process through the Office of Professional Responsibility or otherwise exercising her jurisdiction. But mm -hmm. uh, thus far, the issues that have gone to the, that have been acted on, uh, we have been cleared on. Or, or else no action has been taken over the years of my stewardship as the independent counsel. Now, all of these um, specific factors that various people have asked you, if you reported to the Attorney General when you met her on the 16th of, when was it, the 15th of January? Well, we met with the Deputy Attorney General, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, on the 15th, uh, and, and then there was, and again, I, I did not have these meetings as, as it turned out. No, but there, uh, was but a litany of, yes. there was a litany of things that you apparently, allegedly, did not tell the Attorney General. Oh, yes, that. yes, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, but, of course, shortly thereafter, all of that litany of information became available to the Attorney General. If it wasn't available to begin with, I mean, part of the quarrel that I have had with a number of the uh, suggestions about what I should have told the Attorney General is that these were all in the public domain, as I said in response to questions very early or earlier in the day. Certain things did not occur to me as relevant or germane. It may be that others would say, gee, isn't it relevant that you were asked by Bob Fisk to consider preparing an amicus brief in the Paula Corbin Jones case? I didn't view it as, well, it just didn't occur to me. That's fine. That's fine. But it did become available and no action was taken. No, that's correct. Now, let's get to this um, January 16th meeting with Monica Lewinsky that uh, so much has been made of. Yes. I've been a prosecutor, too. And uh, Monica Lewinsky, from my reading, was treated very, very nicely by your agents. Thank you. I believe that I, is... I hear sorry. laughter from the left, but I often hear laughter from the left, even when you're testifying, and I didn't really think it was fair to laugh at you when you were testifying either. Well, I think uh, that the, the record, a fair assessment of the record will show that we wanted her cooperation, and we treated her with dignity and with respect, but we were prosecutors and we were investigators investigating crime. That's a serious matter, and we made it very clear to her she is in a serious situation. But we treated her with dignity, and we certainly took every step to make sure. I that wonder she, how many sorry. of your accusers have read the log that was kept of every minute of that day. Now, sir, there was also some question as to why Ms. Lewinsky was not allowed to call Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter had been given to Monica Lewinsky by Vernon Jordan, isn't that correct? That's correct. He and the evidence available to you at that time, phone evidence, indicated that perhaps Mr. Jordan had been in telephonic contact with the president at the time he was getting her that lawyer. That is Isn't correct. that correct, sir? That is correct. And in an abundance of caution, you did not want the president to know that Monica Lewinsky was talking to you. Isn't that right? That is correct. And that's a perfectly valid prosecutorial move, isn't it? Yes, very traditional. Nothing As a matter of fact, when uh, later Ms. Lewinsky decided she didn't want to be represented by Mr. Carter on that day, isn't that correct? Yes, she came to a decision to be represented by Mr. Ginsburg. And in she called Mr. Ginsburg and she talked to Mr. Ginsburg, didn't she? Yes, I was just going to say that was in consultation with her family, so I don't know to what extent uh, Ms. Lewinsky was being guided by uh, her parents and, and especially Dr. Lewinsky. But in any event, she changed lawyers from the one that had been provided to her indirectly by the White House to an independent lawyer from the West Coast. Is that right? Oh, yes, and one who is well known to the family. And doesn't the evidence demonstrate that from the 16th on, or from that day on when she was unavailable, there was a three-day frenzy at the White House by Lewinsky, by phone, by beeper, and that Mr. Jordan, Mr. Carter, and Ms. Curry 
were in constant efforts to reach Monica Lewinsky. Isn't that a fact? I believe that is true. Does that indicate to you that they were a little bit afraid of what Monica might say? I think there was concern. <laughs> By the way, when Monica Lewinsky was, I'm not going to say being held because I don't want to run into trouble. <laughs> when Monica Lewinsky yes. was in uh, with your agents. Yes. A and prosecutors. She there, was there not questioned about criminal activity, was she? No, she was not. She was not questioned at all about criminal activity until she was represented by counsel, isn't that That right? is absolutely right, and that's why not one word in this referral comes from any information that was gleaned or gathered on the evening of January 16th. Well, as a matter not of one fact, word. the first time Monica Lewinsky testified in a grand jury was some seven months later. Is it that right? It took a long time and a new set of lawyers, two very distinguished lawyers here in Washington. With and uh, if she was afraid and if she was disturbed on January 6th, she was sure as heck over it by Octo August 6th, wasn't she? He, uh, well, she was at least, yes, she seemed to be. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very fearful of saying anything about state of mind, <laughs> especially in light of a comment I've heard with respect, but in, in, in any event. Do you have before you, Judge, Char, uh, Judge Starr, the first two-incher, two the one that uh, Mr. Lowell gave you? Would you turn to tab 35, please? There are a whole series of remarks on, on page 35, and I think there was a 356, the page number. That's where tab 35 begins. The first uh, bullet, uh, have, do you have it, Judge? I do. The first bullet says Monica Lewinsky testified before the grand jury that, quote, no one ever asked me to lie and I was never promised a job for my silence. All right? Yes. She also testified, but nobody told me to tell the truth either, did she? Didn't she? Absolutely. Now, Monica Lewinsky also testified that she had a conversation with the president in the White House, or when he, on the phone, when she found out that she was on the witness list and the president told her, you can make an affidavit. Th that is words to that effect on... The uh, affidavit, of course, would be for the purpose of avoiding testimony. Isn't that correct, Judge Yes, that, that was correct. That was and the in order to accomplish that purpose, both the president and Ms. Lewinsky were fully aware that that affidavit would have to be a lie. Isn't that right? Yes. And it was the president's suggestion that she make that affidavit? According to her testimony. According to her testimony, yes. We might as well be complete about these tabs when we're going over them. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about fairness, if I may. The President of the United States testified before a grand jury, did he not, Judge Starr? Yes, he did. And um, he was permitted to testify by videotape or by closed circuit television from the White House, was he not? Yes, he was. Uh, how often is a prospective witness before the grand jury permitted to testify from home? <laughs> Very rarely. Uh, usually so that was being overly fair to the president by letting him testify there, isn't that right? We tried to respect the dignity of the presidency and the president, and we readily agreed to provide this alternative mechanism at Mr. Kendall's request right. to his actual appearance before the grand jury. And also, the president was permitted to have his attorney sitting with him and to consult with that attorney, isn't that correct? Yes, Mr. Kendall and Ms. Seligman and, and the... How and many the, uh, prospective witnesses before a grand jury are permitted to bring their lawyer into the grand jury room with them? None. It is inconsistent. Except the president. It's inconsistent with grand jury practice. So you, another favor to the president in the interest of uh, fairness, is that correct? That's correct. The president was permitted to read a statement before he began to testify. How many witnesses in a grand jury are per permitted to read a statement of their own? Ordinarily, it's, I'm, I'm sorry. Ordinarily, it's not done. 
they're there to answer questions that the prosecutors as the legal advisors to the grand jury or the grand jurors themselves have. Now, the president was originally subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury. Yes, he was. After, uh, after he had declined six invitations, six invitations to testify. That's right. And as a, an accommodation to the president, you and your staff withdrew that subpoena and allowed him to the courtesy of appearing, quote, voluntarily. Yes, at Mr. Kendall's request. and Once we, again, being eminently fair to the president. We acceded to his request. We did try and do try to be fair. Now, Judge Starr, when an individual testifies before a grand jury, that individual has three choices. He can tell the truth, one. Right. He can lie, two. Or he can assert his Fifth Amendment privilege not to testify because his answers might tend to incriminate him. Isn't that correct? Yes. When an individual is questioned in a grand jury, is he permitted to say, I stand on my statement in lieu of taking the fifth? No. But the president was allowed to do that, was he not? He was. So much for the unfairness of the grand jury. You were also asked by some of the members here, and a great, great uh, move was made, that none of these individuals in the grand jury were subjected to cross-examination. And yes. that's true, none of them were. That's correct. Are you aware of any grand jury proceeding in which the defense is permitted to come in and cross-examine the witnesses before the grand jury? Absolutely not. It's unbelievable, isn't it? It is completely outside the contemplation of grand jury practice, because that's not the function of the grand jury. It's to gather information and to determine whether there's probable cause to believe that uh, a, a criminal offense may have been committed. That's right. Now, the cross-examination is for the trial, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Now, we're if I change, change horses a little bit and go to the impeachment Yes. Proceeding. The Constitution provides that the sole power of impeachment resides in the House of Representatives. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And that is in the nature of a grand jury proceeding which results in a charge. Isn't that right? That's right. So there should be no cross-examination at that stage of the proceeding either, should there? That's entirely within your prerogative, but uh, to the extent that you're mirroring the grand jury, there is no cross-examination. Well, over and above that, Judge Starr, the Constitution further provides that the sole power to try an impeachment resides in the Senate. Isn't that correct? That is true. So if this House were to permit cross-examination and to hold a mini-trial here, they would be usurping the constitutional duties of the United States Senate. Isn't that correct? Well, I'm not sure I would uh, necessarily agree with that because I think I, I hear I think, the moaning I, from the left again. <laughs> because I, no, I, I, th Somebody I think. Somebody need an aspirin? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I think there are substantial. I, I shouldn't be advising the House of Representatives in terms of its prerogatives, but it seems to me that under the Constitution, you will have a, you know, extraordinary latitude under whatever rules of the House under which you're operating to determine how to proceed. But you're quite right. The Constitution contemplates the trial to be in the Senate. And what you're quite rightly saying is, if one is saying, let's have a trial, you might have the raw power to do it, but it's almost as if, well, that doesn't count because the real issue is, is there substantial or whatever the standard is that the House of Representatives sees fit to, uh, to uh, articulate as its operative standard. Now, Judge, uh, let's do some fairness comparing here. Did anybody in the grand jury, while the president was testifying, laugh at him? Yes. Who? Members of the grand jury. And when was that, Judge Starr? While the president was testifying and telling what he told the grand jurors, they were laughing at him. Is that, your, is that right, sir? I understand that there were some occasions uh, where one or more grand jurors, at, at least that is my understanding, but I want to protect the confidentiality of, of 
the grand jury process and deliberative process, even though you have all the transcripts and, and, and the like. I would just rely on what the transcripts say. All right. Well, when the, when the president was asked questions, he was asked questions one at a time, was he not? Yes. And they were relatively simple questions that he was permitted to give full and complete answers. Isn't that correct? Yes. He wasn't asked six or eight questions at a time, running over a four or five minute period and then given 10 seconds to answer, was he? Definitely not. Now, by the way, uh, did anybody cut off the president when he tried to answer questions? No, I don't think there was any episode when we, we cut off the president. Although, may I say, we were operating as well under very strict limitations. And we did want to proceed uh, with additional questions. Uh, and the grand jury had questions. But Mr. Kendall did enforce the understanding that we had, which was a four-hour uh, session by, by, by the president. And we abided by that. And I don't mean to sound quarrelsome. Uh, in suggesting that uh, Mr. Kendall was not within his rights. He was. Now, Judge, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the public domain and on the television and things that this is, that all the president did was deny sex, deny a sexual relationship with, a, with an intern. He went a lot further than that, didn't he? For example, with Mr. Blumenthal? Yes. As a matter of fact, before Mr. Blumenthal, Blumenthal came in to testify, he was subjected to an elaborate, elaborate lie by the president concerning the relationship with Monica Lewinsky. Yes, he was. If I may. The president told Mr. Blumenthal that Monica made sexual demands upon him, which he rebuffed. All right? And that was not true, was it? That was not true. He also said that Monica Lewinsky threatened to claim an affair and he wouldn't go along with it. That he had been threatened by Monica Lewinsky. Is that right? Yes. Now, this is at a time when the president thought that it was a one-on-one -on -one with Monica Lewinsky, didn't he? I believe that is what he thought at that time. And this would have been a perfect answer. She threatened to say I had sex with her. If I didn't do something for her, I didn't do something. Therefore, everything she's saying is a lie. It would be a very good answer. Now, you're, you've been, it's been suggested that your people used a young lady and betrayed a young lady. Wouldn't that more properly belong to the President of the United States? Well, I'm not sure I should be the one to pass judgment, but we certainly did not betray Ms. Lewinsky. We were doing our job, uh, and we certainly never took any steps other than to try to vindicate the interests of the criminal law. Mr. Shippers, your time has uh, expired. Do you, need do you need additional time? If I may, and if Judge Starr can stand it. Well, I, don't, I, I will the, not lead, need a great deal more, Mr. Chairman. All right, uh, I'll uh, allow an additional 15 minutes, and maybe you won't use that. Hmm. Hope. <laughs> Said he hopefully. <laughs> no. Prayerfully. I'm sorry, that, that, was, that was off the record. Well, Mr. Kendall tells me I should not do that. There's been some suggestion, Judge, that this was merely a private crime. The um, United States Constitution provides for three branches of government, does it not? Co-equal branches. That's correct. And the judiciary is co-equal with the executive. Absolutely. Did I understand you earlier to say that lying under oath, perjury, and obstruction of justice strikes at the very heart of the judicial system of the United States? Absolutely. And I think every judge would agree with that, that this is absolutely inimical to the judicial functioning. It is inimical to our court system. And under that the Constitution of the United States, if the judicial system is destroyed, that is destroying one of the constitutional portions of our government, isn't it? No question that from the founding of the Republic, the importance of our judiciary as an enforcer of rights and the vindicators of rule of law is absolutely critical. So when the President of the United States lies under oath, civil or criminal case, grand jury or other, and obstructs justice, civil or criminal, grand jury or other, he is effectively attacking the judicial branch 
of the United States constitutional government, isn't he? That is the way I would view it. And that president takes the oath that he will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will, to the best of his ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Right? Right. That's not defending, is it? No, it's not. There is a term that has stuck in my brain from these transcripts that I've read, and that is mission accomplished. When Webb Hubble needed help, Vernon Jordan got somebody at Revlon, or the parent company of Revlon, to put him on retainer for no work, right? Essentially no work. So, Vernon Jordan, mission accomplished. When Monica was looking for a job, and it became very urgent for her to get a job, Mr. Jordan again accomplished his mission. Yes, he did. When Ms. Curry, when, the, when they wanted to get rid of the gifts, Ms. Curry went and picked them up, put them under her bed to keep them from anybody else. Another mission accomplished. That's correct. By the way, there's been some talk here that Monica said that she recalled that Betty Curry called her and said, either the president wants me to pick something up or I understand you have something for me to pick up. Later, Ms. Curry backed off of that and said, well, I'm not sure, maybe Monica called me. In the material that you made available, you and your staff made available to us, there were 302s in which Monica said, I think when Betty called me, she was using her cell phone. Do you recall that, I Judge Starr? I do. And in that same material that's in your office that both parties were able to review and that we did, in fact, review, there are phone records of Ms. Curry, are there not? There are. And there is a telephone call on her cell phone to Monica Lewinsky's home on the afternoon of, of December 28, 1997, isn't there? That is correct. Once again, Monica is right and she has been corroborated, right? That certainly tends to corroborate uh, Ms. Lewinsky's recollection. By the way, they did find some of the billing records from the Rose firm in the attic of Vince Foster's home. Yes, that is correct. They weren't under the bed, were they? No, they were in the attic. <laughs> now, Lou, I'm sorry. She wanted to know if it was okay to laugh. Oh, sure. He says, yeah. Lewinsky, now when Lewinsky, when Ms. Lewinsky was subpoenaed, Mr. Jordan contacted the president and then got Ms. Lewinsky an attorney, Mr. Carter, is that right? That's correct. Another mission accomplished. When Monica did her job search and she signed a false affidavit, the next day she was down in New York, or up in New York, trying to get a job, isn't that right? I believe it was the next day, yes. And she couldn't get a job because she, she kind of didn't do a very good job on the interview. She did not feel that the interview had gone well and she was not given a job offer and that concerned her and she expressed that concern. And this is when Mr. Jordan called the chairman of the board and got her the job. He certainly, yes, he called Mr. Perelman and Mr. Perelman then made a call and she was re-interviewed and she was hired. So Mr. Jordan at that time knew that the false affidavit had been signed and that he had a job for Monica. And he went to see the President of the United States and said, mission accomplished, didn't well, he? Well, in fairness to Mr. Jordan, he knew the affidavit had been signed. The rest, I'm sure, would be uh, in, in, in some dispute. But yes, that is But that he is knew the, the affidavit had been signed. Yes. And he knew that the job had been gotten. He went into the President and said, mission accomplished. Yes, that, that is correct. We don't know which he was referring to, whether it was the job or we got the affidavit signed, do we? Uh, no, I don't think that we, we do know that. We just know he said, you know, mission accomplished. And I, I know he felt that he had, you know, engaged in a certain amount of, uh, a certain level of effort to secure that job for Ms. Lewinsky uh, uh, at, uh, at Revlon. Now, Judge Starr, I only have a few more questions. You are a senior partner in a major law firm. Or you were before yes, you took your leave of absence. Uh, yeah, past tense. 
<laughs> you are a, uh, a recognized scholar in constitutional law and in law in general. You have been the Solicitor General of the United States, is that correct? That's correct. Argued a number of cases before the Supreme Court of the United States. That's correct. You've received honorary doctors of law degrees from six universities. I think that's right. You've written numberless articles in various scholarly journals. Yes, I've written a number. You have a completely unblemished career for your entire life as a, as a lawyer. And you're looked upon in the profession as a man of honor, integrity, and decency. Is that right? Well, I would like to think that at least once upon a time, that was the reputation. <laughs> For the past year, you have been trashed in the newspapers, on television, and with snide, backward remarks to which you could not reply. Isn't that right, Judge Starr? Well, I've chosen uh, until now not to reply. But I think the code of silence at some times, in terms of basic fairness, gets to come to an end. And you have been pilloried and excoriated, charged with unbelievable things of which you could, are incapable of being guilty. I cannot imagine me and my colleagues engaging in some of the suggested activities that have been described here seriously. We simply cannot, in conscience, live with one another as professionals. And I laid out in my opening statement the backgrounds of my colleagues, and I've been privileged to serve with two John Marshall Award winners, and that's special at the Justice Department. That means there's no better trial lawyer in the Department of Justice recognized in a particular year, and I've been privileged to serve with two of them with public corruption chiefs. These are career civil servants, and it's not right and it's not fair to attack and calumny career civil servants. But for my part, I've learned that it goes with the independent counsel territory. And the independent counsel job, you didn't seek that, did you? Absolutely not. You were asked to take it, and you tried to leave, and your staff begged you to stay, and you did stay. Is that right? All of that is true. I never sought this job. I'm reminded of the old song about taking a job uh, <laughs> and what you then do with it. But it would be indecorous of me to, to, uh, to, to say it. But no, I was asked to, by the special division, to take on this responsibility. The three-judge panel saw fit to ask me to serve. I had been asked by Phil Hyman, who was Deputy Attorney General of the United States, in January of 1994, whether I would be willing to be considered for appointment as the Whitewater Counsel under Ms. Reno, to be appointed by Janet Reno. Happily for me, she wisely chose Bob Fisk. Unhappily for me, the special division chose me. You have been given a duty that you did not seek, and you've performed that duty to the best of your ability. Is that correct, sir? I have certainly tried, and I did not, to do it to the best of my ability, and I'm proud of what we have been able to accomplish. As I indicated earlier, the records of convictions obtained, but also the decisions not to seek an indictment, the decision to issue thorough reports, all of that is part of what we have co-labored together with Mr. Kendall pointing to the number of persons uh, involved in the investigation. I'm proud of those persons. They're my colleagues and they have become my friends and they've worked very long and very hard under very difficult circumstances and recognizing and we're big, big boys and I mean that in a gender neutral way. And for so that, when we are accused in Arkansas of a political witch hunt we took it, and we did our arguing in court, and we proved to the satisfaction of a fair-minded jury with a very distinguished judge that the sitting governor and the president and the first lady's business partners were guilty of serious felonies. And we had been listening month after month to, it's a political witch hunt. And that was unfair, but we learned that goes with this territory. And judge, for all that, doing your duty, you've been pilloried and attacked from all sides. Is that right? I would hope not all sides, well, but I guess that's yours. Sometimes it seems like all sides. <laughs>
How long have you been an attorney, Judge Starr? Uh, 25 years. Well, I've been an attorney for almost 40 years. And I want to say I'm proud to be in the same room with you and your staff. Thank you, Mr. Shippers. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, the gentle lady from Houston. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I indicated I had a point of order. This might be more preferable as a point of clarification. And that is, I know it's uh, extremely long into the evening, uh, Mr. Starr, but Mr. Chairman, did I understand Mr. Starr to state that we would not expect uh, any referrals on Filegate Travelgate and Watergate, excuse me, no, white right water. <laughs> uh, it's been many years. Um, as relates to the provision in the Constitution on impeachment, did I hear that? You, you made a statement, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if you want to make the statement. Mr. Starr wanted to make the statement, but you did make a statement, and I would appreciate it on the charge of our committee, since we do have that responsibility, if I heard correctly. And, Mr. Chairman, I had an addition to add to the record. Uh, and, and a question as to whether or not, because of the shortness of the time of questioning, whether or not Mr. Starr would be able to answer, or he indicated, I believe, to many members that he would be willing to answer some of our questions uh, by way of uh, written answers. Uh, for example, the question I had of his firsthand knowledge of any details in that referral. Uh, but, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> excuse me, excuse my voice, it's late into the evening, and I do want to add a uh, United States versus Birdman. 602 Fed Second 547, Third Circuit 1979. Uh, I'd like to have that uh, ask, uh, to have it submitted into the record, uh, which deals with uh, the statement that courts have shared the legal profession's disapproval of yeah, the, the double role the, of the advocate. The lady has had her time now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, do you have I, a I like the specific the request? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I would like the specific question answered as to the referrals on Whitewater, uh, Travelgate, and Filegate. Okay, Mr. Starr. I, I, I know. Mr. Starr, can you the, answer that? The, the, I'm sorry. The opening statement uh, spoke to the uh, FBI files and travel office matter. I did not comment beyond those two matters. What did you say on those matters, Mr. I, that's what I asked. Well, if, if the gentlelady would read the, uh, read the report. When I say I didn't comment with respect to the conclusion of such matters, the, the opening statement speaks for itself, and I think we can, in fact, have that as part of the uh, of, as part of the. Well, it is the part of the official record. Yes. Very thank well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, th thank you, uh, Judge Starr, for a, uh, a, a, fun a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Everybody, stay, please. The committee will stay. Maxine. Don't go. We're going to have a meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, committee hearing stands adjourned, but the committee will remain here for a very short meeting. Pursuant to notice and subject to the authority granted in H.R.S. 581, I now move that the committee authorize the issuance of subpoenas for the following individuals, Daniel Gecker, Nathan Landau, and Bob Bennett. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the room Who's is not in order and I cannot hear you. Mr. Nadler? I said the committee, somebody is not in order and I cannot hear you. Okay, I'll try it again. 
Pursuant to notice subject to the authority granted in HRS 581, I now move that the committee authorize the issuance of subpoenas for the following individuals, Daniel Gecker, Nathan Landau, Bob Bennett. Mr. Chairman. Is there any objection? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Nadler. I would like, Mr. Chairman, I would like to know why this proposal in particular, Mr. Gecker, I believe, I, I'm asking this as a question. Well, if the gentleman will permit me, if we have to go into it, we have to go into executive session. Well, to let me do ask that. one question, which we may not have to go into executive okay. session. Okay. What is it, Mr. Gecker? I believe is Miss Willie's lawyer. If you want information about, I presume he may uh, avail himself of attorney-client privilege claim. Why, if you want, he, would, he might have to. If you need information about that, why call the lawyer? Why not call the the witness directly? Well, I, I can't answer that, but I will say the attorney-client privilege is not uh, uh, does not overwhelm an impeachment subcommittee. Uh, committee. Uh, is there any objection to the approval of the three subpoenas? The right Mr. Scott. Preserving the right to uh, to object, Mr. Chairman. You want to put your put your mic on, <coughs> Mr. Chairman? Are we? Um, Am I to assume by the issuance of these subpoenas that we are not confining the, the yeah. inquiry to the star allegations? Yeah. Well, what we're doing is pursuant to the House joint, is the House Resolution 581. Uh, it's pursuant to that resolution. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, reserving the right to object. The gentleman reserves the right to object. Mr. Chairman, I would just say that at some point, I would appreciate it if we would focus the, uh, the inquiry into specific allegations so we know what we're investigating. We are now not focused on the star allegations. I have no idea what the allegations are going to be. And if we're going to conduct an inquiry that we can conclude at some point in the foreseeable future, we have to focus the uh, al to focus on certain allegations that might be impeachable offenses. Mr. Scott, this is focusing on material we ha the committee has received in executive session. We have this Chairman. material. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my uh, reservation. I thank the gentleman and Mr. Mr. Watt. Uh, reserving the right to object. Gentleman reserves the right to object. Um, the the motion that I'm reserving. The, the unanimous consent request that I'm reserving the right to object to is to authorize the subpoenas. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't... These are, these are subpoenas for depositions. I, I don't feel like I can pass on that without having some background information, and I understand... We have to, we have to do a go into executive well, session. Well, then um, that's... I, I hate to put us to that burden, but I don't know how I can pass on it without um, without having some more we'll information. Have to clear the, we'll go into executive session. We'll have to clear the room. No, wait, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I, what? Mr. Chairman, a question. Why do we have to be in executive session to debate this? Because the material to explain the rationale for wanting these depositions is material that is in the exec is executive material well with, well, with respect I, mr chairman i i just wanted to i don't time. feel like i can i can vote i can sit here and not object without understanding the rationale myself i understand um, and we're perfectly willing to go into executive session i'm not trying session. to violate executive rule Wait, okay would the, would i'm the chairman yield yeah i would no. yield i mean look it seems I am befuddled by why we are doing this. I understand... We wait, wish to uh, take depositions of these three yeah, I people. I understand that, well, Mr. We'll explain that in executive session. Well, wait, session. A, if I might make my point, sir. Sure. Which is, I think the public, most of which is wondering why this is dragging on and on, also has a right to know why we are doing this. So what I would suggest, what I would suggest is that we discuss as much of the rationale for this as we can out of executive session so the public can hear. And then if there are any specific references as to why we have to go into exec about materials that are gathered in executive session, we can go in for that portion. Mr. But Schumer, we, we can't discuss really anything 
around the edges even without uh, transgressing on executive session material. So let's just go into executive session. Well, then what I would move, Mr. Chairman, I have no problem with us going into an executive session, but then I would like for us to be able to discuss the rationale for this without using executive session material in public session. And that's the move I would make. That's what I would well, propose. Well, we can't do it. We're going to have to go into well, wait, executive you know, session. Uh, well, now, come on. Uh, it's... Uh, Chairman, yeah. I'd like to be heard on the motion. Yes, you may. And, Mr. Chairman, I, I know it's late, but we didn't decide, and you've been accommodating to us in some regards, but we didn't decide to do this all in one day. And I do not think it is legitimate to constrain members by running too much in one day and then saying, oh, it's getting late in the day. Then do it tomorrow. We've been spending, many of us felt that we should have started this a while ago. You wait until November 18th or 19th, then you put it all on one day. It's simply not legitimate then to argue the time constraint. I think this committee has erred grievously in going into executive session and discussing things in executive session that ought to be discussed publicly. It is very, very strange to have these arguments about the need for the public to know, et cetera, et cetera, and we do it all in secret. This is the committee that released grand jury information onto television. We made history in denying what had traditionally been something that would be kept somewhat private, and we do these by de we, we debated doing that in a, in a private session. There is simply a great abuse of this, and again, I have to say, then adjourn, come back tomorrow, come back next week. You know, as far as these depositions are concerned that were sold are so important, I don't know why they weren't taken in September or October or earlier in November. I don't, I don't know how they became an emergency overnight. The fact is that you have, I think, overused the executive session. There are very important questions, and it is simply inconsistent to say this is a terribly important issue to the American people. People need to know about it, and we'll go in a secret and make all the decisions. Virtually every decision this committee has made, it is made in secret, and it is simply an inconsistent position to talk about the important public issues that are involved here by going into it in secret. All right, the gentleman's made his point. The gentleman oh, is... Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I think I have five minutes. I'm sorry, look, I didn't decide that we would try to do it all in one day. But having decided to do it all in one day, you can't use that against us, and you can't use that to constrain things. You know, it's, isn't it somewhat paradoxical? We talk about how important this issue is. We talk about this is such a fundamental constitutional question, but we've got to worry because it's getting late. Then don't schedule us so that you constrain the most important thing we could possibly be talking about Steve. by the cock. Then let it go over to tomorrow. Let it go over to the next week. We should have been doing it a month ago. Chairman. But I will not be constrained by an, a self-imposed handicap uh, of, of the cock. And I still do not think we should go into executive session without some justification as to why we have to go into executive session. We're not discussing national security. We're not discussing anything that's going to give anything away to anybody. We're not tipping off anybody. So I do not understand, and I think we have a right to be told why we have to go into executive session. I thank the gentleman. The, uh, there Chairman. is a motion before the committee to authorize the issuance of these subpoenas, then the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Chairman, there were members Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes aye. Mr. McCollum. Mr. McCollum. Mr. Chairman. Mr. McCollum votes aye. Mr. Mr. Geekis. I move to strike the last word. Uh, this is unworthy of you, Mr. Chairman. All right, hold, hold it. Mr. Chairman. Uh, just calm down. Mr. Berman. Mr. Chairman, earlier today, you made a ruling, which I agreed with, on a point of order raised by the gentlelady from Texas, that with respect to the jurisdiction and to inquire, the House had spoken. The House did not mandate this committee to investigate everything under the sun. It allowed this committee to conduct an inquiry on anything under the sun. We have the authority to decide what we are going to inquire on and to limit within the House action what we're going to decide on. Mr. Schumer makes a point. There are two different distinctions. When you issue subpoenas for people involved in the Kathleen Willey case, the implication of that is that there is a decision that that becomes part of the impeachment inquiry. Many, every, er, everyone on this side of the aisle felt at the time and voted to limit the in inquiry to the Monica Lewinsky referral. 
the independent counsel has not made a, refer a referral on the Kathleen Willey case. He has not found that there has been substantial it's and really credible incredible. information that, that conduct by the president that may justify impeachment. Uh, that finding has not been made and that referral has not been made. So that there is a bifurcation. It's, it's First, the issue of whether we go into this new this line of inquiry is something that should be discussed in open session. Then, if our position is lost, then in executive session, the justification for the subpoenas can be raised. That's the only that's the only question uh, that I have, and that's why I think we should be able to get the justification for the subpoenas if we decide we're launching into that inquiry. And I sure hope we don't. Yeah, could the just would the gentleman yield? Because I didn't get to finish my point before. Could the chair give us some, without treading on executive session or anyone's confidentiality being disclosed, could the chairman give us some idea why these three people were chosen and not others, and where the chair intends to take this, these depositions? What is the point? We already have heard from Mr. Starr that he doesn't think the Willie episode rises to a level of impeachment. In my judgment, he has a pretty low threshold for impeachment, and if he doesn't think that the Willie affair does, then that's pretty dispositive to me. And here we are with three complete, you know, yesterday we heard talk of John Wong. It was very hard to figure out what that was all about. Now we're hearing these three. One can only draw the conclusion, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, one can only draw the conclusion without without um, hearing an explanation that the majority doesn't quite know what to do here and is sort of prolonging this with whichever they can, which whatever thing they can grab onto. Because there's no logic to this, at least to me, I'd like to hear it, and I think the public is entitled to hear it. And I think in this case it could well be argued that executive session is being used as a shield because there is no good explanation as to why these three people have been, are going to be deposed, why other people are not, and where the chair and where the committee intends to take the depositions of these three people. As again, on a, on in, at least particularly in an area where the, uh, where the Office of Independent Counsel has said there is no impeachable offenses as far as it can see. All right, the, chair, the, chair, the, chair, the chair will declare a five-minute recess. For oh, what purpose? Let's discuss All right, well, let him declare his reasons.
committee will come to order. The committee will come to order. I agree it's an issue. I am not saying don't do it. I'm saying we ought to do both. I, I move that pursuant to Rule 11, Clause 2G1, this committee meeting be conducted in executive session. The clerk will call the roll. Move the previous question. It's non-debatable. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes aye. Mr. McCollum. Mr. McCollum votes aye. Mr. Geekus. Mr. Geekus votes aye. Mr. Coble. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith votes aye. Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Gallagher votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Inglis. Abby, why is this motion undebatable? Mr. Inglis votes aye. Mr. Goodlatte. Mr. Booyer. Mr. Booyer votes aye. Mr. Bryant. Mr. Bryant votes aye. Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Barr. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins votes aye. Mr. Hutchinson. Mr. Pease. Mr. Pease votes aye. Mr. Cannon. Aye. Mr. Cannon votes aye. Mr. Rogan. Mr. Rogan votes aye. Mr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Graham votes aye. Miss Bono. Miss Bono votes aye. Mr. Conyers. What do you think, man? Mr. Conyers. No. Mr. Conyers votes no. Mr. Frank. No. Mr. Frank votes no. Mr. Schumer. No. Mr. Schumer votes no. Mr. Berman. Mr. Boucher. No. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Mr. Scott. No. Mr. Scott votes no. Mr. Watt. No. Mr. Watt votes no. Ms. Lofgren. Yeah, we should. We should. We should say this was a debatable motion. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Ms. Waters. Mr. Meehan. Mr. Delahunt. Mr. Delahunt votes no. Mr. Wexler. Mr. Wexler votes no. Mr. Rothman. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett votes no. Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde votes aye. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from California, Mr. Berman. Berman votes no. Mr. Berman the votes no. From California, Ms. Waters. Ms. Waters votes no. Mr. Shabbat. Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Goodlatte. Aye. Mr. Goodlatte votes aye. Have all voted who wish. There's Mr. Hutchinson. Mr. Hutchinson. Aye. Mr. Meehan. Mr. Hutchinson votes aye. No. Mr. Meehan no. votes no. The clerk will report. <coughs> Yeah, that's what we're all running back from there. Mr. Chairman, there are 19 ayes and 15 noes. And the motion is agreed to, and the House, that is the committee, will stand at ease while we clear the room. Point of order before that, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Yes, Mr. Senator. What? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, according to the rules, at least a cursory review of the rules, a, a, a move to go into executive session is indeed debatable. Yes. Is indeed what? Uh, it is it? indeed debatable, and you said it was not debatable. I was so, so, I would ask I was that so we, informed by staff. Well, could council make a ruling on that, please, and point to the relevant part of our rules which shows that it is? I mean, now we're really flying by the seat of our pants. All right. I moved the previous No, the no, fair debate. did, and I just no made debate, a point Mr. of order. Chairman. Your, your point of order is well taken. It is debatable. I was informed it was not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But if, do you want to debate this some more now? Yes. yes. 
Well, you've already spoken, so Mr. Nadler. Move the previous question. Is recognized. We'll undo the roll call. We'll dump the roll Vacated. call and we'll start Vacated again. Ms. Jackson Lee will be next. That's fine. Thank you, Matt, Matt, Mr. Yeah, Could the committee be in order? Go ahead, Mr. Nadler. I'm all ears. Hmm? We voted, but we're going to undo it. Yeah. Regular order. That's why it's too noisy. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, oh, we, we, the, the room won't be cleared till we go into executive session. Didn't ask it to be cleared. I simply asked to be quiet, Mr. Chairman. Oh, quiet. Um, okay. I do not want it cleared, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. We should not go into executive session until a reason is given as to whether as to why we are going into executive session. Number one. Number two. Before we go, before we talk about these subpoenas, we should have some basic idea of why we're being asked for these subpoenas. Specifically, the subpoenas apparently relate to the Kathleen Willey affair, which, as Mr. Schumer pointed out, the, the special prosecutor says raises no questions that rise to the level of possible impeachable offenses. And so I would want to know, does this relate to the Willey affair? If it doesn't, does it relate to something else? And why are we being asked for this? And I can't believe that some reason can't be given in public session. Secondly, if we are to have a motion to go into executive session, I would ask, that the motion say go into executive session then come back into open session so we can address whatever it is we can address publicly because I believe we owe that to the public. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. Gentleman can make that motion when we're in executive session. No, no, I think we have to make that motion. Be that ought to be a condition of our going into executive session. Well, I don't agree. Because if we make that motion in executive session and it's voted down, we can't even say it was voted down. That's true. And that's not right. Gentleman has it exactly right. But it's not the right thing to do or the right way to conduct our business. Okay. Are you through? I would move to amend the motion then. I hear you. Thank I'd you. I move to amend the motion. I have a parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Boyer has a parliamentary inquiry. Could I finish the parliamentary amend inquiry? I'm sorry. Do you have more to say? Any amendment before his parliamentary inquiry? I'm sorry, what? You don't have to yield to a parliamentary inquiry. Could I finish stating the amendment before Mr. Booyah's parliamentary inquiry? Surely you can finish anything I move, you like. I move to amend the motion uh, that after we go into executive session, when the executive session is completed, we come out and resume regular session and then discuss the matter of the, uh, of the proposed... Um, 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 that the, I'm, the, of the proposed subpoenas uh, to the extent we can in public session and that the vote on those subpoenas be held in public session. The clerk will call the roll. You've heard the motion. Oh, you want to talk on the motion, Ms. Amendment. Jackson Lee? Well, the amendment to the motion, that's right. Yes, Ms. Lee. And it, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to associate myself with the words of Mr. Nadler for two reasons and his motion, and I will speak globally to, to the issue. Uh, one, Mr. Chairman, um, you were quoted as saying that in spite of the resolution passed dealing with how we would proceed in this uh, impeachment process, that you look to the end of 98 uh, to complete this process. I think it is important for the American people to know where we're going with this process, how long, how many people will be caught up in our web. Uh, and clearly, I think, uh, to go into executive session will preclude us from discussing this in an open manner as to whether this is going to go on and on and on and on. We have determined today that uh, the uh, witness, Mr. Starr, has indicated that certain referrals would not come here. Are we now encouraging him to bring other referrals that he have not even uh, uh, contemplated or has already indicated there is no basis? And so I would just argue that we are not, um, uh, if you will, providing uh, the direction uh, and allowing for discussion on the direction by going into executive session, calling witnesses, of course, uh, that we don't know in, for what basis we're calling them. And I would ask, Mr. Chairman, that we not uh, go into executive session on these matters and maybe find out as a whole where we're going and when we'll be able to complete this matter uh, as a, in a timely manner. And I yield back. The gentleman from Indiana. Mr. Chairman, I, I am uh, somewhat bewildered and confused, so I'm going to ask a parliamentary inquiry. We had a motion here before the committee. I moved the previous question, and then we had a vote. Now, I'd like to ask the parliamentarian, why would that vote not stand? Because I'll answer that, because I told them that the motion was not debatable, uh, and I was wrong. It was debatable. So I did not want to ram through something uh, under the mistaken ruling of the chair that it was not debatable. That's why. I made a mistake. 
Well, then I'll move the previous question on the Mr. Nadler's uh, amendment to the Gentleman motion. moves the previous question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those nay. No. No. The ayes have it, and the previous question is moved. The question now occurs on the motion of Mr. Nadler to when we go uh, to go into executive session, but then to hold an open session thereafter. And to vote in the open session. And to vote in the open That's what session. I said. What would we vote on? The vo after the, dis the discussion. Oh, you want the I, I understand. You vote on the subpoena. I, I hear you. Let me clarify. The debate would be in the in the closed session. Okay. We come out and debate whatever was openable in the open session, and then we would have the vote in the open session. We understand Mr. Nadler's motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Oh. No. no. Roll call. Roll call. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Oh. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes no. Mr. McCollum. Mr. Geekus. Mr. Geekus votes no. Mr. Coble. Mr. Coble votes no. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith votes no. Mr. Gallagly. Mr. Gallagly votes no. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Inglis. Mr. Inglis votes no. Mr. Goodlatte. Mr. Goodlatt votes no. Mr. Booyer. No. Mr. Booyer votes no. Mr. Bryant. No. Mr. Bryant votes no. Mr. Shabbat. No. Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. Barr. Mr. Jenkins. No. Mr. Jenkins votes no. Mr. Hutchinson. No. Mr. Hutchinson votes no. Mr. Pease. No. Mr. Pease votes no. Mr. Cannon. No. Mr. Cannon votes no. Mr. Rogan. Mr. Chairman, regrettably, before voting, I simply want to make sure I'm clear on Mr. Nadler's motion, and I apologize for the confusion, but the noise and the rapidity in which this was moving was so quickly, I wasn't able to get a clarification of my satisfaction. Is the motion that we're debating upon now whether to debate the issuance of subpoenas in executive session no. and then the, can i clarify the amendment again yes please the amendment says we will go into if the amendment is adopted we will go into executive session we will discuss whatever we discuss in executive session then we'll come out and resume the public session debate whatever we can debate in the public session and then vote in the public session with that uh, elucidation uh, rogan votes no Mr. Rogan votes no. Mr. Graham. No. Mr. Barr. Mr. Graham votes no. Mr. Bono. Ms. Bono votes no. Mr. Barr. No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. McCollum. No. Mr. McCollum votes no. Clark will report. Side get to vote. <laughs> I enjoy a good cigar, which Henry does also. Now we have that. What happened? Have you ever heard of Cut to the Chase? Mr. Clark, the. 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 Clark will continue to call the roll, and don't let me try that again. Uh, okay. Mr. Conyers. Aye. Mr. Conyers votes aye. Mr. Frank. Aye. Mr. Frank votes aye. Mr. Schumer. Aye. Mr. Schumer votes aye. Mr. Berman. Mr. Berman votes aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott votes aye. Mr. Watt. Pass. Mr. Watt passes. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Ms. Waters. <coughs> Ms. Waters votes aye. Mr. Meehan. Aye. Mr. Meehan votes aye. Mr. Delahunt. Aye. Mr. Delahunt votes aye. Mr. Wexler. Aye. <coughs> Mr. Wexler votes aye. Mr. Rothman. Aye. Mr. Rothman votes aye. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett votes aye. Mr. Hyde. No. Mr. Hyde votes no. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from North Carolina. I vote um, aye. 
Mr. Watt votes aye. Delahan started out okay also. Mr. Chairman, there are 16 ayes and 21 noes. Mr. Nadler's motion is defeated. The, 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 the question occurs now. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. For what purpose Mr. does the gentleman <laughs> seek recognition? To offer an amendment. Uh, the previous question has been moved. I haven't heard the previous question moved. Move I've now the previous, previous question. question. Excuse me, I sought recognition to offer an amendment first. Well, you aren't, you're not recognized for that purpose. Let's, let us move on, I, no, Jerry. I, I Come Mr. on. Mr. Chairman, I move the Important previous question. Important is not question. a dilatory amendment, and you may even agree to it. You have spoken on this question already. No, it's a new amendment. It's not the same question. No, that's not Mr. Right. Chairman. What's your amendment? My amendment is simply, Mr. Chairman, that the, that the ayes and nays on the issuance of the subpoenas and the ayes and nays on a motion, well, the ayes and nays on the issuance of the subpoenas be made public. As cast in executive session. All right, the gentleman's motion is not in writing, but that's all right. We're accommodating tonight. You've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Move the previous Chairman. question. Chairman. Yes. Chairman. I have a motion that this committee now move to executive session. That's already on the table. All those in, in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed nay. No. The, aye, uh, the ayes have it. Roll and call. Roll call. Roll call. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes yes, aye. Mr. McCollum. Aye. Mr. McCollum votes aye. Mr. Geekus. Aye. Mr. Geekus votes aye. Mr. Coble. Aye. Mr. Coble votes aye. No, but Mr. It's not Smith. It's the same amendment. Mr. Smith votes aye. Same Mr. Motion. Galligley. Aye. Mr. Galligley votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Inglis. Aye. Mr. Inglis votes aye. Mr. Goodlatte. Aye. Mr. Goodlatte votes aye. Mr. Booyer. Aye. Mr. Booyer votes aye. Mr. Bryant. Aye. Mr. Bryant votes aye. Mr. Shabbat. Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Barr. Time for you now. Aye. Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Jenkins. Aye. Mr. Jenkins votes aye. Mr. Hutchinson. Mesa. Aye. Mr. Hutchinson votes aye. Mr. Pease. Mr. Pease <coughs> votes aye. Mr. Cannon. Aye. Cannon votes aye. Mr. Rogan. Mr. Rogan votes aye. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham votes aye. Miss Bono. Aye. Miss Bono votes aye. Mr. Conyers. Uh, no. Mr. Conyers votes no. Mr. Frank. Frank. Mr. Frank. Frank votes no. Oh, inexactive. Oh, inexactive. Uh, uh, so no. Mr. Frank votes no. Hey. Mr. Schumer. No. Yeah. Mr. Schumer yeah. votes no. Mr. Berman. No. Mr. Berman votes no. Mr. Boucher. No. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Mr. Scott. No. Mr. Scott votes no. Mr. Watt. No. Mr. Watt votes no. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Ms. Waters. No. Ms. Waters votes no. Mr. Meehan. No. Mr. Meehan votes no. Mr. Delahunt. No. Mr. Delahunt votes no. Mr. Wexler. We'll take it. Hey, Matt. No. Mr. Wexler. No. Mr. Wexler votes no. Mr. Rothman. No. Mr. Rothman votes no. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett votes no. Mr. Hyde. Aye. Mr. Hyde votes aye. Mr. Chairman, there are 21 ayes and 16 noes. And the motion is carried and the House will go into exe the committee will go into executive session and we will stand at ease until the room is cleared. Um.